So I wanted to start by introducing myself and uh, uh, telling you a bit about uh, the Eastern, the EU-funded Eastern Partnership uh, Civil Society project that we are all representing. Um, my name is Monica Bucurencio and I'm the, the team leader of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society facility. Um, I uh, wanted to really welcome all of you to uh, today's webinar on the civil society fellowships uh, that were recently launched on the on the first of December. Um, we were really happy as a team to see there is a quite a that there's high interest um, in the region in the six countries, and um, it's uh, yeah it, I, I think today would be a really will be a really good opportunity for all of you to find out more. Um, about the fellowship program and to ask the questions, the burning questions that you have. We also published a document with fre frequently asked questions um, uh, today or yesterday, uh, Lena, correct me. <laughs> um, so you can, you can have a look at, at that as well. Uh, but um, today will be uh, very much about um, you understanding the, um, uh, the fellowship program structure. We have two types of fellowships now. So uh, for those of you who are maybe um, aware or who were acquainted with our uh, previous fellowships, it's worth mentioning that now we have the civic digital fellowships as well um, and the community engagement fellowships. Um, you will be hearing today from uh, Simon Forrester, who is our capacity development expert, but who is also dealing with the community engagement fellowships, as well as from Irina Velska, who is our expert um, on civic tech and hackathons, who is in charge of the civic digital fellowships. Um, and we also have with us uh, two wonderful ladies who are um, our previous fellows as well and who are here in uh, different capacities, in fact, because they will be uh, telling you about um, their experience as a fellow, as well as uh, take the floor um, as uh, our uh, fellowship liaison coordinators um, in the country. So Maria and Elena will, uh, will also be taking the floor later on. Um, I, uh, I know that everyone is really keen to find out more about the fellowship program. So I don't want to take up too much of your time with this, but um, I did want to take the opportunity to uh, make everyone aware of the fact that we as a team are representing a, a, a new funded project that is um, uh, that has a, let's say, a number of activities that go beyond the fellowship program. Um, we also, as a project, organize annual hackathons with civil society organizations and the civic tech communities of the countries. And um, early next year, we will also be launching that, um, that process. Um, and for those of you who are interested in the civic digital fellowships, definitely keep an eye on that. We will, also, we will, uh, we will start uh, launching different capacity development activities from early next year as well. Um, so uh, please do subscribe to our newsletter and uh, keep an eye on our website and social media. Um, and you will get all of the, the opportunities. You will be aware of all of the opportunities that we are launching. I see there are two attendees who have raised their hands. So Lena, if you could give the floor to Anna and Olga and see uh, maybe first to Anna and then to Olga and see what they would like. Uh, Anna, I think you are now able to talk, so you just need to unmute your mic. Okay, maybe Anna raised. I can also um, question. unmute Olga. So, yeah, Olga, Olga or would Anna. you? So you you are both able to take the floor now. If you want, you just need to unmute your mics. Okay. Uh, maybe they raise their hands by mistake. Um, if you have any problems, if you want to ask us anything, you can uh, either, either use the Q&A or, or the chat, depending on what type of questions you have. There is already something in the Q&A. Yes, so from Narek, okay. Uh, for those of you who joined after I was um, mentioning the technical aspects of today's meeting. So yes, by default, um, everyone who is 
an attendee, not a panelist, will be muted and will not have access, will not be able to start their video. If you do want to uh, take the floor, you just need to raise your hand and we will give you the floor. The host will give you the floor. Uh, for your questions, um, try to use the Q&A because it makes it easier for us to uh, keep track of what you're asking and make sure that we are really addressing all of your concerns. Okay, so yes, you are by default muted and by default you cannot use your videos. Um, I think um, I think I, I will pass the floor to Simon so uh, he can start with the with the part that really everyone wants to hear on um, how to make your fellowship application and the, the success factors and what we're looking for in a fellow. So Simon. The floor. Great, thanks Monica. Yeah, I'm sure that Anna and Olga raised their hands because they're excited that we get on with them um, talking about the fellowships. Um, so you, we've already heard that there are two um, two types of fellowship. But, and before we, we go into um, explaining a bit more about the detail of those two types of fellowships, I think it's important to make it clear that all of the civil society fellowships have the same benefits. So it doesn't matter if you're a community engagement fellow or a civic digital fellow, you'll have the same benefits. And, and those benefits uh, include getting up to around 5,000 euros of financial support to, to implement a, a fellowship project. But equally importantly, as a fellow, you get access to, to, to training and coaching, uh, to great networking opportunities, and um, becoming a member of the, the, the fellowship uh, alumni, which is also another great um, networking opportunity. So regardless of the type of fellowship that you're interested in, the benefits um, will be the same. And um, as we get into some of the details, we'll also be emphasizing that there are no quotas for the different types of, of, of fellow. So we're opened up uh, since the 1st of December for applications for both types of fellows, and we'll be evaluating them all in an in a equal, equal manner. So, um, the Community Engagement Fellows and the Civic Digital Fellows. Um, whoever selected to be a fellow will be contributing their fellowship towards achieving our overall objectives, which is around building capacity in civil society for uh, more engagement in, in policy making in, in the reform processes, keeping governments to account, um, and for building capacity uh, within our communities and getting citizens to be more involved in, in public debates. So both the types of fellowships contribute to the, our, our overall um, objectives, um, but they might be doing it in a slightly different way. So let's let me just talk through what we mean by community engagement fellowships. So if you're going to be a community engagement fellow, um, we'll be looking for um, civically minded women and men um, who can offer some leadership in your community and demonstrate a real commitment to, to, to leading change in your communities. And you might contribute to that change process through uh, involvement in, in, in policy making. It might be at a national level or um, getting involved in local level um, policy making. You might want to use your fellowship to do some research and to collect uh, evidence. Um, and perhaps you want to use a fellowship for monitoring public expenditure um, and, and monitoring public services which, which are being provided. These would all be examples of, of community engagement fellowships. But equally, maybe you want to use your fellowship to, to show some leadership in terms of uh, contributing to capacity development of civil society in your community, maybe to help um, civil society organizations to be more accountable, to help them to be better uh, linked to their constituents. Um, or perhaps you could use your, your, your fellowship to work on um, organizational development or uh, cooperation between civil society organizations. So th th these are all the areas where we would be looking for fellows to contribute 
to change uh, in their communities. Um, and, and this is what we're referring to the community engagement fellows. Of course, we have a second type, and that is the civic digital fellows. And, and they are going to be contributing to the same overall objectives, but perhaps they will be able to contribute in a slightly um, different way. And um, Irina, I hope, will maybe we'll say a few words about that. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so yes, civic digital fellowships, uh, again, here we are looking for civically minded individuals and civically minded people who want to use the experience uh, to contribute, develop, or further promote and raise awareness about uh, how technology can be used for community needs for promoting better accountability of the government or improving the quality of the public services. Uh, that's saying this in a kind of very formal way, something that you all most likely uh, have read in the guidelines for applicants. But if I cut the story short, it will be like, okay, so civic digital fellowships are designed to promote civic tech and open data as a in, like a part of the civic tech, you know, as a fundamental thing for developing of civic tech in the Eastern Partnership countries. So you know that civic tech is a kind of very general um, general term that is an umbrella is an umbrella term that covers many things and many aspects and many times, right? So uh, civic tech is not only about chatbots or it's not only about you know like standalone standalone mobile application. Civic tech is basically any technological solution that aims to solve an existing challenge in this or that way. This can be, you know, by, um, as Simon was given an example, for instance, monitoring the public spendings, monitoring the budgets. Uh, it can be by making uh, data accessible. I will give you more examples in a second. Or it can be the case that um, you just, there is already, there are already some, good solutions and tools in place, but people just don't use them and you want to change the situation. So basically, civic tech is a, is a very, very general term that can be applied to different things. So uh, there are four types that we suggest you to think about, and maybe uh, your idea can fall uh, under shall fall under one of those. So one of them is basically maybe you're uh, proposed, you, you want to use your fellowship to raise awareness and promote the actually uh, the things that are preconditions for developing a civic tech in the country. We mean with this, the uh, advocacy campaigns or awareness raising campaigns for open data, data quality, for good e-services for citizens can be provided by the state or provided by civil society as well. Uh, about the need for budget transparency and so on. So basically, I think you, you might be thinking in this direction. Maybe you want to use your fellowship, uh, you can apply your fellowship and your skills into making uh, publicly important da data available, or in some cases, even existing, right? We all know that data, we, we live in a data society it's not we don't live in a technological society information society anymore we live in a data society and we know that um knowing what's going on it's all about data you know we, it's all about the data set so maybe uh, unfortunately some of the data set some of the data already exist and in publicly important data for instance the um annual um annual tax reports or tax returns of public officials they exist, they're available, but they are in a PDF format that are not machine readable. And basically it takes physical, physical, you know, like it takes humans to go and read them and put them in the tables and then compare. So maybe you want to use technology to make this data accessible and machine readable. Uh, you can go other examples. It can be the annual reports of the big uh, state companies, state-owned companies and so on. There is a lot of data that can be done into the machine readable. And it is important because then this can be used by civil society activists and by you as well 
to uh, promote the same things as transparency, accountability, and the importance of the public oversight over, the, uh, over what's going on in your home country. It can be the case that data is not available and you want to promote or uh, develop a tool that will collect and gather the data, make it machine readable, and open it. Again, it's up to you. In some cases, this can be done manual, it can be user generated, or in some cases, this can be sensors or, you know, think about this. There is a wide range of options again. As standing alone as development and civic tech solutions, as those that address the community needs, as I said, government's accountability and improvement of public services and so on, which is really important here that it must be a tech solution, must be a tool. We would like you to stay away from pure information platforms. So solution is first of all means um, user interaction with the system, active user interaction with the system. So basically send a report, coming back something and doing. So it can be visualization, it can be uh, reporting, it can be, you know, like uh, is a chatbot, is it some logic, but it we uh, really... Uh, would like you to stay away from pure information websites or platforms and so on. So it's a bit different story. It's not a solution. It's a, just a platform. And the third one and the, and the last one is basically promoting and expanding existing civic tech solutions because sustainability is one of the important things. We know that there are many great initiatives that have been launched in the Eastern Partnership countries recently. And we know that some of them need support, some of them need a break to keep going and get more users and become really sustainable. So maybe your fellowship uh, will help uh, you to make one of those solutions, to upgrade one of those solutions and promote it among the users and basic, sometimes maybe even train the users how to do it. So that's talking about the fellowships, plea uh, of civic digital fellowships. I pass the floor to Simon, but we'll be ready to answer your questions. Right, thanks very much, Irina. Um, and as you said, it, it's, it's great that you're going to stick around for the whole of the webinar. So if anyone has questions for, on Civic Digital, they'll be able to um, talk to you more on, uh, on, on that. And I see that in our, in our Q&A, there are already some questions coming in. And one of them is asking, um, can you apply for both? And the answer is no, you have to make a decision of what type of fellowship is suitable um, for, for, for you. We hope now um, you're beginning to have some ideas of what type of fellowship might be suitable for you. Um, and so you, then the next step is really to, to, to check whether you are um, eligible to be a fellow and whether you have the potentiality to be a fellow. Um, you have to be a citizen of one of the six Eastern Partnership countries. So you have to be a citizen of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, uh, Georgia, Moldova, uh, or Ukraine to be eligible for the mm -hmm. fellowships. You have to have good working English. And um, this is a really important in, uh, re requirement because this is a, a regional program, you know, so it's international and to help with the networking, um, you need to be able to have a common language to communicate in. In the guidelines for the fellowships, you can read a bit more about um, the level of English required and how you can prove that you have that English level. So it's really important that you have good English. There is no um, age restriction for the fellows. Um, the only restriction being is you have to be at least 18 years old. So you have to be 18 years and above to make an application, but otherwise there's no limit. You can't be a, a previous fellow. So if you've already become a fellow, you can't become a fellow again. So those who've already benefited from the fellowship program, I'm sorry, but you can't apply for a second, uh, a second fellowship. Um, if you're thinking about being a fellow, you have to think about how would you prove your own personal track record and your commitment to leading change in your community because part of the ap application process is to is to see that you can prove that you have that track record so that's uh, on our, our checklist here to see whether you could be a potential fellow or not and of course um we also you also need to have a really great idea of how you will use your fellowship um to contribute to change uh, Irina and I have talked a little bit about ideas of what you might do as a community engagement fellow um, or as a civic digital um, fellow. 
But to, to help you a bit more with that, to give you a, a bit more idea about what fellows can do and what they have done in the past, um, I'm going to ask um, Mariam to um, tell us some stories about um, previous fellows. Uh, Simon, Simon, before we go to Mariam, there are two questions in the Q&A that I think we need to address. And, and one question in the chat. Okay, Mariam, you have to wait a minute. Let's deal with these questions. Um, the, the fellowships, you have, the eligibility is you have to be a citizen of one of the six countries. But your fellowship activity, what you do as a fellow, um, can be within the region. So because we're not providing a large amount of financial resources, we would probably expect you in terms of the, the feasibility of fellowship that you probably will be doing it in your own country. But there's no reason why you cannot um, involve the other countries. Or if you happen to be uh, for some reason outside of the country where you're normally a citizen, but it's within um, the region, um, that's also um, that's also OK for the fellowships. Um, for anyone who, who wants to make an application through the initial stage, which is the concept note, um, in the concept note is where you're able to explain what your ideas are and we can respond individually there if you're under uh, some unusual circumstances where you want to implement your fellowship project. Um, in terms of uh, there was a question about being um, if you already work within a civil society organization implementing a, a project in collaboration uh, with uh, with that particular organization can you apply well the, the fellowships um require you to be nominated or to be supported by an organization or at least be supported by someone um who also works professionally in civic tech who can um vouch for you to say that, that to, to give us proof of who you say you are and what you want to do so we do expect fellows to have some association um, with 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 organisations, but it's not necessary to um, to be an organ to, you know to, to be already be a member of an organisation. And if you're a member of an organisation which has already supported a fellow in the past, that's also okay. Uh, you wouldn't be excluded um, fr from from that. Um, A, so I was just checking the, 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 the Q&A. There's another question about the, uh, there's a question about the language um, eligibility. Simon, maybe, maybe before that, we will take the question uh, from the chat from uh, Sosi Takian. So are individuals eligible or only NGOs? I mean, individual experts, public figures, influence, make, influence makers. So you can be, you, you, can, you can apply as an individual or you can apply as a member of an organization. Um, as I've said, uh, you need to have some kind of association. We would expect you to be, uh, to be nominated by an organization because it might be that you need to have the support of an, of an organization to, to host you. Or if you're applying for a, a civic a digital fellowship, you, you need to be supported professionally from um, civic, civic tech. Uh, I just Monica, wanted to, to add to this, I think. Yes, I wanted to add to this and also to one of the other questions. So it is individuals who are applying for the fellowship. This is, it, it will not be an organization. Uh, as Simon was saying, we do expect those who are applying for the community engagement fellowships to have some sort of link uh, with a civil society organization or, or, or society well, initiative group. Um, because you want, we want to see that they were indeed civically engaging before, uh, but you would in any case be applying as yourself, as, uh, as an individual. Um, I, uh, I wanted to also quickly go back to what Lucine was asking on whether a participant should conduct the fellowship in his or her country, and just add one thing, and, and Lucine also feel, please feel free to give us more uh, details of what exactly you have in mind in the chat. But what I wanted to say is, um, of course, the, 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 your fellowship project should benefit one of the countries of the Eastern Partnership region. But if 
um, if within that project or within that you know action that you have in mind, uh, you, for example, would need to exchange with a, a, a civil society organization that's uh, based in one of the EU member states, this is something that, uh, that our fellowship can facilitate. It cannot be the main purpose of what you do by any means, but there are, there are elements that, um, that can, the, around the exchange of experience, for example, that can take place in, uh, in the EU member states as well, if there's a need. Uh, and I wanted to 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 add that, but uh, again, Lucina, please feel free to give us more more details on that. Okay, I'll pass the floor back to Simon because there are more things coming in the Q and Yeah, thank you. Um, and it's really great that you're posting those questions in our Q and A. Um, I really encourage you to keep posting and to give as much detail as you can if you have a real particular type of question. What I'm going to suggest, though, is that we do come back to most of these questions when we finish the overall presentation about the fellowships, because some of the questions maybe will be answered um, as we go through. Um, so let's let's go through the rest of what we wanted to present to you, um, and then we'll come back to all of the questions. So just keep posting the, the, the questions. It's best if you use the Q&A for the questions so we can keep track of them, um, but you can also put comments um, into the chat. So um, we got to the point where we wanted to, to really um, give you some inspiration to show to you what fellows have done in the past and some examples of, the, of, of success within the fellowships. And, and Marianne was very um, patiently waiting to, to share with you those um, experiences. Marianne. Thank you, Simon. I'm ready to take the floor. Uh, I hope you see me. Um, hello, everybody. And um, I'm Mariam, and I will briefly present the success stories. But before that, I'd like to ask a question to you all. Uh, what can unite a teacher from Moldova, a public health professional from Armenia, sportsman from Ukraine, and a, a diplomacy student from Georgia? So four different personalities and one program that connects them. And this program is Eastern Partnership Civil Society Fellowship. And yes, it is my biggest honor to present some of the outstanding success stories of the fellows from our regional alumni network. And to introduce a little bit of personal touch, I will br briefly discuss my fellowship uh, achievements too and share my stories to you that may give you additional motivation to apply for this life-changing program. So let's start um, um, with uh, Victoria Isaac um, from uh, Moldova, uh, driven by the enthusiasm to bring behavioral and social change. Uh, Victoria is a school psychologist and English teacher with 15 years of experience and the founder of the Center for Training and Education, uh, Educational Development. Uh, so aim of her fellowship was to uh, tackle bullying and cyberbullying in schools of uh, Satamir district. It's one particular district of uh, Moldova. So how did she do it? So through training and campaigns. First, she trained the principals, vice principals, and the presidents of student council from all the gymnasiums of Satamir district and raised the awareness of the phenomenon of bullying and, and its mitigation measures. Then she ran um, the anti-bullying and anti-violence uh, campaigns in five schools of um, Satamir district with high, highest rate of bullying cases. Uh, as an achievement, it's um, important to outline that the project raised awareness of approximately 100 school managers and more than 1,200 pupils of bullying, uh, uh, on bullying and um, its uh, prevention. The workshops facilitated discussions and dialogue between teachers and students and among students. And on top of that, um, she produced recommendations to the local district board of education, and she actually brought the government uh, bodies into the discourse. That's, that's one of the reasons why I'm personally very proud of her uh, achievement. Um, another fellow whom I'd like to feature today is Vladislav Iryuk from Ukraine. And Vladislav is the role model and very inspiring to me personally, because he's the person who shows that um, uh, anyone, like in this case, a sportsman can evolve the civic mind, work on the grassroots uh, 
uh, sports facilities and take this like research the pro problems um, on the grassroots level um, and uh, discuss that find some solutions and uh, raise the political discussions and actually change the sports reform reform concept and uh, Vladislav represents the person that uh, like when you say the word change we actually mean it and let me tell you a bit more about Vladislav and his background so holding a master's degree in sports management um, uh, Vladislav is the CEO of the a startup uh, named uh, Health to Home. They offer the rehabilitation services to the key residents. Um, the aim of this fellowship was to analyze the general conditions of sports facilities in five municipal Ukrainian cities and then conduct collaborative roundtables training and uh, engage the central authority, the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports of Ukraine in discourse. So first he selected five um, Ukrainian cities and then organized um, uh, then he did interviews, researched the cases, organized roundtables, did trainings, and uh, and then uh, ran the social media campaign to disseminate information to the larger audience. So in general, he conducted 20 individ individual interviews, uh, organized five roundtables, uh, which were attended more than 100 um, stakeholders. And um, yeah, in the end, uh, he suggested the recommendations to the relevant official bodies, which were added to the sports reform concept by 2020, 2020, 2028. The third fellow is um, uh, Suren Galstian from Armenia. And Suren is a person who really moves me with his uh, personality and professionalism. Uh, holding master's degree in public health, um, Suren is contributing to developing national policies, strategies, uh, and practices uh, practices in reproductive, maternal, and uh, child health care in Armenia. So the aim of his fellowship was to study um, the experience of pregnant women uh, in maternal health care centers of Armenia and advance the implementation of an integrated person-centered model of um, obstetric care in the country. So first he conducted the research and pursued the advocacy campaigns with his teams. Um, so he examined the gaps, inconsistencies and violations of patient rights. And then he prepared the summary of specific recommendations, engaged the Ministry of Health uh, and run, launched the advocacy campaign. Uh, he trained um, administration and staff members of um, 12 maternity hospitals, but um, first, but, but also it needs to be outlined that um, he uh, he uh, collected information from 729 patients of all uh, 12 health uh, facilities of the of Yerevan uh, delivering maternal care services. So 728 patients studied, and uh, the, the, then the research paper delivered. Then afterwards, the advocacy campaign launched, and the Ministry of Healthcare engaged. So that's why I'm very fascinated by Suren and he's the person who, who made his um, contributions to uh, promotion of personal centered maternity care uh, and he uh, tries his best to advance the health, well-being and human rights and women uh, of women and children in, in Armenia. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to share my personal stories to you, uh, everybody. Uh, so you may have um, um, questions well, like about the fellowship, which uh, fellowship uh, topic which I implemented. Uh, so uh, my fellowship aimed at studying the enforcement of Georgia's uh, declared political priorities in terms of youth engagement, uh, women empowerment and environmental protection. So we all are amazed by those catchy political phrases, uh, phrases um, said by the politicians, but uh, when it comes to actual implementation of those catchy phrases, um, the situation is quite different. So I uh, wanted to study the Tbilisi City Hall, the local municipality, through these three directions, which were uh, priorities of 2017-2018, um, uh, so youth engagement, women empowerment, and environmental protection. Plus, I scrutinized the public administration performance, checked the accessibility of public data, and uh, transparency of um, e-governance. By that time, I was uh, the student in diplomacy, at Tbilisi State University, and um, I was Tbilisi, Tbilisi based, and I had all the opportunities to um, to research and uh, also um, to hold the 
one-to-one, -one, -one, like face-to-face um, meetings with the actual decision makers. So first, I, I did uh, desk research, assess the municipal budget and strategic documents of the uh, municipality through those perspectives, gender equality, environmental mainstreaming, and youth participation. Then I interviewed the field experts, uh, think tank uh, representatives to see the perspectives from their side. Uh, and on top of that, I organized the round tables with the local decision makers from those uh, um, uh, departments and uh, to bring the research findings to them and to suggest the um, recommendations. And as an achievement, uh, I'd like to say that uh, my, my team members and I produced the bilingual reports in Georgian and in English. If you're interested, you can see that on the website and also in, uh, produce the list of recommendations to the Tbilisi City Hall. And I'm very proud that after uh, two years of submitting those recommendations, some of the recommendations were actually taken into consideration, uh, such as uh, mandatory technical inspections on personal vehicles, a new transport policy, a sustainable sustainable mobility program, uh, which were, which was like those um, recommendations were one of the top priority recommendations which we discussed with the um, actual uh, uh, authorities um, when, when we were at the meeting with them. So um, just to keep a long story short, I want to to say to everybody that um, like apart from giving me instruments and professional mentorship to run my uh, first very independent project as a fellowship proposal and project um, this program provided me with uh, master classes to improve my soft skills to improve my communication visibility storytelling networking skills and open the door to the regional network of young professionals who are shaping or if not now, who will shape the future of the Eastern Partnership region? So it's uh, you are more than welcome to apply since um, it's really a life-changing experience to you all. Thank you very much. Back to you, Simon. Super. Thank you very much, Mariam. Um, lots of great ideas and lots of inspiration there. So thank you very much indeed. And um, for, for after listening to Mariam's examples there, I, I hope that you are all. Um, ready and waiting to make an application. So I wanted just to make clear what the actual application process is. Um, firstly, the first really important thing to do is to read the guidelines for the fellowships. So you can download the, the, the guidelines um, from, our, from our website and access it through our social media. Um, I, I know it's not the most exciting thing to read, um, 15 pages of guidelines, but I think many, any, many of the questions that you have can be answered by the guidelines. And for sure, it's really important that you follow the guidance in terms of your um, eligibility and how you want to frame your, your application, how you respond to the, the questions in the application. So please, the first step, go through the guidelines. Then you need to think about preparing a concept note, because for the fellowships, there are now uh, there's now a two stage uh, application process. Firstly, you need to prepare and submit a concept note. And then secondly, later on, there will be a follow up full application for those who are, who, who are positively evaluated uh, at the concept note stage. So you need to prepare um, a concept note. Um, which itself um, is, is a series of questions which will not take you too long and you have to apply um, through the uh, application online but before you log in and start to make your your application you really do need to read those guidelines to understand what we expect you to put into the uh, into the concept note once you're clear on your concepts and you have your ideas then you can uh, go online uh, fill in the concept note and make your and make your submission um, online. Once you've made your submission, um, we will send you an acknowledgement, so you will be um, feel safe that you know that your application was received. And then there will be an evaluation process of the concept notes, and um, only those which are evaluated positively will then be invited to go to the second stage, uh, which is to complete a, a full application. 
So between uh, learning that you've been successful with your concept node and the deadline to submit your full application, we're referring uh, to this period as the incubation period. And during this incubation period, um, you'll have more time to work on your full application. And for those of you who uh, need further guidance on the full application or have questions about completing the full application, we will be here to help you with that. So you'll be able to get support to develop your, uh, your full application. Um, I also should stress that it will only be at the point where you make your full application, where we will ask you to um, submit any supporting documents. So you'll see in the guidance guidelines that there are a list of important supporting documents that we expect you to provide. You do not need to upload those in the concept note. There is no place for them to be uploaded in the concept note. But you do need to make sure that you can provide all the supporting documents at the full application stage. If you cannot provide those, then unfortunately, we will not be able to take your fellowship forward. So it's really important while you're thinking about your concept that you also think about providing, uh, think ahead to providing the, the full um, supporting documents, which will include um, a passport copy to show your citizenship, um, a CV, a nomination or reference um, letter, and the proof of your level of, of English. So these are the supporting documents and in the guidelines, you can read much more um, about what is expected in terms of those, uh, those supporting documents and how you can um, be ready to, to submit them. But I again have to stress that um, the first step is the concept note and only those who are successful to move from concept note to full application will be invited to, to make a, a, a full application. So only the selected concepts will move into the, the fourth and the fifth, um, the fifth stage. I know that we have uh, the questions are coming in in the Q&A, which is really good. Maybe now will be the time we'll probably start answering some of, of, some of those. Um, the first thing about preparing your concept note that I want to stress is that um, we do expect the concept notes to be um, uh, written and, and submitted online and in English. So the concept notes must be submitted in English. If they're in any other language, um, I'm afraid they will not be eligible. They have to be in English. And it's really important that you complete every section uh, of the concept note. So make sure you, 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 you completely fill in all the parts in the concept note. And like I said, you have to make sure you're going to be eligible um, and that eventually we'll, we will ask you for any um, proof documents. And you have to be able to clearly um, express yourself in terms of what your achievements have been and to demonstrate to us your leadership potential and to express yourself in terms of your ambitions and your personal development as, um, as a fellow. I also want to point out that um, Although in the guidelines we um, explain the general themes that we're looking for, and we've already talked about those in terms of the community engagement and the civic digital fellowships, um, for this particular call um, for fellows and for the next year's calls, um, there will be kind of extra bonus points for those of you who will use your fellowship to contribute to the goals of the um, 2022 European Year of, of, of Youth. So um, <clears throat> we want you to, to, uh, to think about carefully what your concept will be for your fellowship. Um, the, closing, the closing deadline for the fellowships is not until the 17th of January. So you have time to think about it. You need to be thinking about, um, you know, is your fellowship really needed? Are you able to use your fellowship to make some some changes what difference will your fellowship make who will benefit from the fellowship apart from you as a fellow um who who else will be the benef beneficiaries of your fellowship and how will they benefit um and make sure as i've said make sure that your fellowship really fits within the the themes um which are described in 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 the guidelines um 
So if you have a great idea from a fellowship and you want to submit a concept note, then you go online and you submit a concept note. And then um, if you're successful, uh, if your content note is successfully evaluated, you'll be invited to then move forward to the next steps and make a full application. Um, and just to give you an idea of what you need to look, look ahead to in terms of the full application, um, I will ask uh, Elena now to just to say a few words about this full application um, process. Yeah, thank you. First, I, wanna, I want to appeal to those who haven't yet, yet submitted their uh, concept note. Please do it, you have time, and then you will have time to complete your full application. So those who will succe uh, successful uh, concept notes applicants will be informed of their selection by email and provide with an online link uh, to open a full application. And this year, uh, we didn't have it before when I was a fellowship, uh, we will have an incubation period. So during January and February, you will be working on your full application, but you will not be working yourself. You will have uh, two coordinators, so me and Mariam, uh, we will be in touch with you. And if you, if you will read the guidelines, if you will watch this webinar and you will st still have questions, you will be able to ask us and we will be in touch with you all, all this period through, through January and February. Uh, so uh, as Simon mentioned, you should choose one idea, only one idea, if you will uh, submit two uh, different ideas. So only one can be uh, during the full application, you will be um, submitted only one full application. And this uh, full application uh, should have uh, a clear and well justified objective. So uh, please um, don't, uh, you, you can dream, of course you can dream, but your uh, main objective should be realistic uh, and uh, can be achieved in less than eight months. So uh, this is example from my own fellowship project. Uh, the main objective was to support a campaign to advocate ad adopting the draft law of Ukraine uh, on public consultation and its implementation. And I, I wanna tell that, yes, it's not uh, feasible for you during the fellowship to create national legislation or something such big, but it's it possible to contribute through research and advocacy. So you can do something small in a big project, but it will be your own project. Uh, and uh, if your concept note is selected, you will need to develop a full application and please don't forget about some very important things. So reread the guidelines, one more time, if you need two times, three times, but all your questions, the answers for all your questions are there for sure. And, and learn how to complete the full application. If you have questions, ask uh, me and Mariam. Uh, design a set of activities which will achieve your fellowship object, object and include a list of concrete outputs. Uh, the, purpose, uh, the proposed budget for your, for your fellowship project should be itemized based on the real costs and clearly feed the activities that you mentioned in the, in the action plan. And the budget template will be provided uh, with a link when you will be evaluated as a, um, you will be able to go to the second step. And uh, please don't forget to upload all supporting documents so you, did, you didn't it uh, during the concept note, but the CV, the passport copy, nomination or other references letters, uh, English proof, everything you should upload during uh, the second period. It will be in the beginning of the next year, but please, you have time, uh, apply with your co concept now. We're waiting for your applications and uh, I wish good luck to everybody. And Simon, please, floor is yours. Super, thanks, Elena. 
Um, and we're, we're coming towards the end now, and I, and I kind of really wanted to end up with, with um, the, 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 the time frame for this particular call for the, for the fellowships. Um, as we have stressed, um, the 17th of January is the closing deadline to receive the concept notes. So you have to complete and submit your concept note up until the 17th of, uh, of, of January. Um, this, this webinar um, uh, will be, is being recorded and, and we will upload it and make it available. So um, if you have any friends or colleagues who haven't been able to join us today and, and they want to learn more, then make sure you can share with them that this information that they can watch the webinar later on. Um, once we receive the concept notes, they will be going through a, an evaluation process and we will not wait until the 17th of January to, to, to make that assessment. We will be looking at uh, the concept notes on a, on a, on a kind of a rolling um, basis. Um, this means that we would expect that um, by the middle of January, um, we will already be able to inform some of you that you will be invited to go to the full application stage. We can't give exact date at the moment, but it will be somewhere around the middle of January. Um, and then those a bit later, uh, towards the end of January, will also learn that they can make a full application. Um, so you will then have um, um, a few weeks to work during the incubation um, phase up until the 15th of February. So the 15th of February will be our cutoff date to receive the full applications. But we would expect that you will have um, at least two or three weeks to work on your full applications before that time. And as we have mentioned, we have some support available to you. So you'll be able to um, ask us questions and get help on an individual basis if there are issues that, that you want to, um, to discuss with us. Um, and then the full applications will go through an evaluation process. And um, that evaluation process is explained in the guidelines. You'll be able to see how your full applications would be evaluated, how they're going to be scored. Um, and then um, we would expect that around the middle of March, we will be able to inform those of you who will be successful to be um, fellows that you will be uh, notified uh, in, in, uh, in the middle of March or towards the end of March. And therefore you will then start your implementation from uh, March and April um, onwards, where you have up to eight months to implement your, your, um, your fellowship. So that gives you an idea of the timeline. Um, I know that there were a couple of um, questions in the Q and A about when will the concept notes get evaluated and how much time do I have to wait for to be notified? We can't give you exact time periods here, but as I've said, we would expect to um, start evaluating the concept notes before the 17th of January. So some of you will get information be before them. And um, we are deliberately doing this because we really want to encourage people to, to apply quickly, and then you'll have more time to develop the full applications. Um, I think there were other, other questions um, in the, uh, in, in the, in the Q&A, which, which maybe I can answer now, but I'm going to suggest also to um, Irina and, and, and Monica, Maria Elena, um, to have a look in the Q&A and um, to, 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 to interrupt me if they want to answer some of the, um, the questions that I don't manage to, um, to cover. We have already received quite a lot of questions by email. Um, and so I just wanted to um, uh, emphasize some of the responses on, on those um, kind of frequently asked questions that we've already had. Um, there's a few questions about um, eligibility in terms of countries, and I know that some of you were again asking about, um, apart from you have to be uh, a citizen of one of the six Eastern Partnership countries, about whether actions can take place outside. Um, I think we, we have covered that already, but maybe M Monica might want to say a bit more on that, depending. I think there's a few more questions in the Q&A about it. Um, I think we've already made it very clear that you have to decide which type of fellowship that you want to apply for. You can only apply for one type of fellowship. Um, some of you have asked um, that if you make an application and, you're, and, and um, you're not happy with it and you want to delete it and to make a new application, um, this is not possible in this call. 
once you've submitted your concept note, you won't be able to delete your concept note. However, um, there are going to be calls for fellows during 2022. There will be two calls and there'll be further calls in 2023 and 2024. So you will be able to make new applications in the future. And uh, because we're gonna have at least two calls every year, you won't have too much time to, 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 to wait. So you'll be able to, if, you, if you're unhappy with your consent note and, and you want to change it, you have to wait until the next call if you've already made um, the submission. In terms of um, proving your level of, of English, um, I have to refer you to the guidelines because in the guidelines we do give quite a lot of information about how you prove the level of English. The burden of proof is very much onto you. You need to upload documents which will satisfy us, which will prove to us your English is good enough. Having a certificate um, of English, for example, from IELTS is one way in which you can do that. Um, but one of the questions we had in the Q&A was that if you had studied uh, at the degree level at university and the language of tuition was, uh, was English, you need to be able to offer us some proof that that was the case. Uh, it might mean getting a letter um, from the, the university just to, to say that that was the, uh, was the case or a letter from your, uh, from your tutor or lecturer um, there. Um, we've also had some other um, questions about um, the application um, process. Um, so again, I would stress that the, the, the application, the, the concept note has to be made online. Um, and um, we, we don't have a concept note format available offline to you to, to, to complete. So we would like you to submit um, online. If you have any particular technical problems related to that, then please do email us so we can respond to you individually. Uh, if you have issues about making a, a, an application. Um, we've had questions in the past about um, um, how long do the responses need to be. Well, in the concept note, um, there's a space for you to respond to our questions and they are limited in size. So you will have to think carefully how you want to articulate your um, responses. If you are filling in the concept note, if you've logged on and you're filling in the concept note and, and you, you need more time to complete it, you'll be able to log off. And then when you log on again, you can come back to the concept note to, to carry on your application. As soon as you press the submit button, your concept note will be submitted and that will be it. And you will not have the opportunity um, to, to, to change it. As we've already mentioned um, during the concept note um, stage, um, there's no need to upload any supporting documents, but you must be able to upload them for the full application. So there's no point to submit your concept note if, you, if you're unsure that you will be able to, to provide the supporting um, documents. Um, and uh, the, we, we had some general questions, what happens after the concept note? I think we've gone through that process, explained to you that there will be the second step. Um, if you're successful, you'll be um, notified that you're successful and we will send you a link to then uh, you can able to make your, um, your full application. Um, I'm going to kind of close up now and I think that we need to um, start going through any of the remaining um, questions in the Q&A. While I have um, a look through, let, yeah, Monica, do you want to-, to, to I can to, actually help with this because I've been keeping an eye on those questions and I will start basically going one by one. Okay. The most popular question is about the language and the English language. So uh, could you please remind where we can check our language eligibility? Uh, that's very easy. Go to the uh, guidelines and please check them. An easier way to check if you are eligible, if you kind of, you know, the level, if you want to understand your level, if you can follow this webinar easily, that's it. But basically, you, you, yes, your English is good enough for this. Okay. Uh, there, there is also another the question uh, about... Um, but these uh, individuals who completed a degree in an English-speaking country still need to demonstrate language skills. 
Well, if you completed the degree in an English speaking country in English, yes, that's Simon what said, show us, you know, be able to prove us somehow that you did it. It can be your diploma saying that you, the tuition language was English. It can be a letter from your tutor, from your, whoever your professor, just show us that you did it. Uh, okay, so the, the, a very, very similar question. If I was st studying MA in English, the same answer, give us a reply that you did it. Uh, the question, if you take an ILTS test in 2017, yes, it's still valid. It's also a proof of your English. So that's, oh, that's also done. Uh, it doesn't mean, please, it doesn't mean that you have to pass a test. No, as we get, have shown in many examples before, and people ask, there are more ways to show that you speak English, you understand English. And no, there is no need, no requirement for you to pass any TOEFL or whatever, just prove us that your English is of good quality of working language. That was the answer. Uh, Simon, throwing the ball to you to pick up the rest. Thanks, thanks, Serena. Yeah, I, I just actually again want to emphasize that issue on the English language proficiency. Um, you know, I, there, there are lots of ways to prove your 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 English level. So just think about what documents you might have to prove it and you can upload them. We will as long as you upload something, if we want to follow up on whatever you upload to the full application, we'll come back to you. You know, if something is not clear. But as as Arena says, that we don't expect you to take a test, especially um, for 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 us. Um, there were more questions um, around um, activities in the different countries. Um, yes, maybe you will take up those questions if you want. I, I will follow up for you with the questions. We'll read the questions and you, so you can. Answer. And I th I think Monica maybe also wants to come in with some advice. There. Yes, I, I wanted to uh, respond to indeed some questions on on location, on um, on citizenship, and. Uh, on Belarus, because I, know that I, I saw that there were uh, uh, questions on that. Um, I, I'll, you know, I'll start with the question from Resida on uh, organizing the, the, the project or including as beneficiaries um, uh, people from with Azerbaijani origins who live in, in Georgia. I think that's, that's really straightforward for us. Yes, that's possible. Yes, you can include them. If anything, it's uh, quite... Um, positive sign or a plus for us because it really means that you're engaging uh, not only with 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 your well with the, the beneficiaries in your country but uh, also with the uh, beneficiaries in other neighboring countries so that's uh, that's a clear yes from from us um, Anna was uh, asking um, Anna from Georgia was uh, saying that she cur is currently living in Estonia and would like to apply for the civic digital fellowships um, and was asking whether she should relocate back to Georgia to carry out her activities no you don't have to relocate back to Georgia for us <laughs> that's that's for sure um, if you can prove if you can show us that what you are planning is really benefiting Georgia <laughs> is benefiting some uh, clear group uh, uh, from Georgia you don't you can carry out your activities online if um, if you think they will still have the impact that you would want those activities to have so that's not a problem there I will just add here please make sure that you are still just you will need to prove that you are EAP citizen right you're still yeah. Georgian citizen yeah yeah so yeah I think one one of the things that uh, we were emphasizing indeed is that the passports uh we all are a lot more mobile now. We are all working, uh, we are all becoming digital nomads to some extent, at least in our line of work. So uh, so are we in our project, uh, but you do need to, for, for us, the, the, the citizenship does matter in this context. So you do need to prove your citizenship. Um, I, we had also a question on the fellowship program being presented as, uh, so to present a workshop or a research proposal for the fellowship program. Um, this is, and I really, I, I wanted to, to uh, clarify some things here because we had this kind of uh, questions on the previous phase as well. This is not an academic fellowship. This is not meant to be part of uh, your PhD or, you know, uh, somehow help you with your PhD proposal or um, uh, MA thesis or any of that. It's really not about, in our case, an academic fellowship. However, uh, having said that, uh, we had fellows who were uh, 
uh, when they when they were uh, applying to be our fellows, had as their main occupation an academic occupation. So they were either, you know, uh, doing their PhD or they were postdocs or, um, so that was really what they were spending their time on. But um, they, they also wanted in addition uh, to engage um, with on different other things that were uh, relevant for our fellowship. And I will give you a very concrete example. So we had someone from Georgia, uh, who was working on a PhD about uh, nursing practices. So uh, that would not have been as such eligible for the fellowship program. But because based on that, she was making policy recommendations, she was trying to reach out to policymakers to raise awareness about certain issues. Obviously that part was relevant for us and was, was, uh, was what we were looking for. Um, so you can link what you are proposing to us as a fellowship project to some of the academic activities you might have. Yeah, right, because we are looking also for evidence-based um, advocacy campaigns or evidence-based, uh, you know, po policy recommendations and, and, and all of that. So you can, you can link them, but be sure that you really emphasize this, the civil society aspect of it. Um, there, there is a, a question on, um, whether a project involving Belarus can happen outside of Belarus, yes, um, it can. Um, and um, there is no doubt about that in the current context. Um, so I, I think I, this I would leave here. Indeed, a project helping refugees from Belarus in a new country would be eligible. Yeah. Uh, with the visibility requirements, there are always exceptions, there are, there are always uh, reasons why uh, even the EU would agree that EU visibility would, is not what we want uh, if it puts people at risk. So in certain contexts, the EU visibility requirements can be waived, but it's not something, it, it's really something that is done only in exceptional cases. So if you think that you are, uh, in a situation where this would be justified, please do explain it in your uh, concept note. And we will take that into account. If you are selected, we will take it up with the EU. We will make sure that uh, they give us their approval uh, for you not to abide by the standard EU communication and visibility requirements. Okay. Uh, and Lucy, Lucina was also clarifying uh, her, her previous questions on whether the fellowship should be conducted. Okay, you were you meant whether a fellowship should be conducted in one of the ERP countries or in more uh, countries of Eastern Partnership region. I think by now it should be quite clear. Uh, we are generally expecting people to conduct their fellowship activities in one country. If you uh, have uh, good justification for uh, conducting your activities in several Eastern Partnership countries, that's great. Uh, we are a regional project, so we are happy to see that uh, we have regional projects as well uh, supported by the fellowship. I don't think that that's a, at all a problem, but it's not a requirement. So, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe the, the the last thing, the last three questions that I see in the Q and A, one of them is uh, about how long it will last to review the concept in order to know if you if you're selected or not. What do we say to that, Simon? Did you, <laughs> did you, I don't know if you were briefly addressing that before. Yeah, I can. I mean, I, did, I, I said a few words about that. And that was that um, we at this stage, we can't give definite dates. However, um, we because we intend to review the concept notes not on a continuous basis but from time to time which means that um there will be some of you who will be able to respond to um earlier on whether you're selected to go to the next stage or not so um before the the, the shutoff date for the con concept notes is the 17th of january but before the 17th of january we will have already reviewed some of the concept notes and those that meet the evaluation criteria are successful uh, will be informed about that before then um, so we would expect at least two times to do a selection process um, but we can't give we can't give the exact dates but we will ensure that you all get at least two weeks prior notice to be able to, to complete your um, your full application yeah 
Okay, I, uh, I guess I can uh, can continue taking the questions on the standard sample form for a recommendation letter. We don't have that. It was something that we uh, were being asked before. Uh, send us what you think makes sense. Send us a recommendation letter that is that really says something about yourself, about your activities, about your civic engagement and uh, about why you would be uh, a suitable candidate for the fellowship program. There are no templates, there are no rules, uh, but try to make it relevant and try to make it personal. Um, I mean, ask your uh, whoever will be recommending you to do that. Ira. I will just add to this question, a question from the chat that I found uh, from Aliona. I'm the head of the civil society organization. Can my colleague nominate me? Because it uh, it would be strange when I nominate myself. And I yes, would say I, I would say yes. Um, uh, obviously, don't put pressure on them to write. <laughs> you know, if you are the head of that organization, maybe there's a bit of a let's say uh, you you have the upper hand from a PowerPoint point of view. Um, if yeah, you can you can do that, but you can also ask for a letter of recommendation from one of your uh, partners. If you work with other civil society organizations, um, uh, you are board partnering member. with them to or board members exactly. If you do if you do have boards, um, that that can be even sometimes Sometimes, you know, we had, uh, I think, letters from some of the beneficiaries saying more, more like testimonials. So, you know, you can be relatively creative there. Um, obviously, don't write a recommendation letter about yourself. But <laughs> other than that, if it's uh, if it's something that uh, really proves, um, what, um, tells us what you're doing um, and tells us, uh, yeah, about who you are, I think that's that's fine. Um, Christina is asking about whether she can apply for uh, with a project about migrants in Ukraine. Um, it, uh, I would have, I don't know if Simon and Dira want to add to that. I think it's quite uh, they, the question is quite vague. So, uh, but first sight, yes, uh, but it, it depends a bit on on what you have in mind. Um, I looking at the at the topic and at the country, I would say. This is very much in line with what we would be expecting, but yeah, maybe you you can you can uh, feel free to to raise your hand and give us more details about what what you have in mind if you want. Okay, we are very we're luckily close. We have no more open questions in the QA, but I did find one more in the in chat. the chat. So yeah. okay, so the question from Anna. Hello and thank you for this great opportunity. I have two questions. First, is it necessary that I represent some CSO? which I can reply now. No, it's not required that you represent a CSO. It's required that you show that you should show just your track of civil society activity work. If, especially if you are affiliated with a civil society organization, you don't have to represent, but you can be affiliated with this organization as a volunteer, as a person who regularly works with them and so on. It's not obligatory that you have to be a member of this organization. Especially if you apply for Civic Digital Fellowship, there is no such requirement at all. Second question, how can I prove my ability to really lead a community to reach its best if we have not been engaged in civic projects previously? Tricky question, Simon, Monica, who wants to take? Well, this actually one is linked a little bit to the, the nomination um, letter or the reference letter is that, you know, we the, the guidelines says that, you know, we really want to identify um, individuals who have who are already showing some leadership or have the potential to show the leadership to, to make, make change happen in, in their community. So it's up to you to uh, be able to demonstrate that it might be that you have certain items on your CV, you maybe you have achievements or experiences which will be clear in, in, in your CV. For example, if you had previously led a project uh, in your community, that might be an example to show your leadership. If you were the person that actually established an organization and you took the initiative to establish an organization, that should be on your CV. We should be able to, 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 to see that. Or maybe you would like the person nominating you or you can ask uh, another person for a reference letter, which will um, uh, vouch, you know, vouch for you as somebody who can show potential uh, leadership. So you can demonstrate that potential or actual leadership um, experience in, in, in many different ways. We really leave it very much up to you to, to demonstrate that. Um, 
maybe Monica has anything, any more ideas you want to put, suggest on that? No, I think in, indeed you have uh, the you have the, the the recommendation letter, denomination letter as uh, the the number one uh, tool or number one way in which you could you can show us um, that uh, you have the ability to. To, to lead a, a, a community project. Um, I think it, we also need to understand from your application why now you want to be engaging, why you want to become civically active now as opposed to before. Um, and um, I think a very strong justification there, something that triggered your, your interest or your desire to do this, if we can understand that, that also helps. Obviously, we want to. Uh, we don't. Yeah, we don't want to take on board people who are applying for the sake of applying because okay, this is an opportunity and that's all. But if you can, if you can show that something triggered this, that um, in your in your previous work you had some you you showed signs of uh, you know leadership potential and so on that that's um uh, i think that that would that would be good enough for us um obviously taking into account everything else that's in your concept note and uh, the project that you are uh, proposing uh, to us uh, but i also wanted to just to add one other thing here uh, as an example um i think if you have if you volunteered or if you have engaged in any student councils or associations or uh, you were organizing some things in your school or university, those kind of things we can also take into account. So try to really reflect uh, on what you have done that can show that you have this potential. Um, again, we are really not, we are quite flexible um, on, on this. I think that's, that's all. We have we... We, Sorry, we, we have a couple of more questions that, that, have, that have come out. One of them I'm very curious about. Yeah. Um, can I apply for a project about a flour mill uh, for community development? Um, it sounds very intriguing, difficult to really give a direct answer on that. But if, if it's something about um, community development, um, and one of the, the themes for the Eastern Partnership is in terms is the resilience of local economies. So um, it, it sounds like it could well be uh, an appropriate topic. If you really want to find out more, you could email us uh, a question so that we could respond individually um, to you. I, I wouldn't like to guess any more about what the flour mill, uh, this, this idea is, but it seems it, it's possible. Can I, can I add something on this one? Because I think there's one important uh, aspect we need to clarify because we did have uh, several, we, we did have situations like that before. Because of the fact that we are, what the EU calls the technical assistance project, we have limitations in what we can support. So if you are thinking about building a flower mill or, or you know, if you, are, if you have in mind any kind of construction, or you know, buying equipment or this kind of things that we cannot cover, that we cannot finance because of the way in which we ourselves are receiving the funding from the European Union. So that no, if you, I don't know what to, I don't know what you would want to do with the flower mill. If 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 it's somehow not about that and it's about community engagement in other way, then obviously yes. But that's one uh, for sure one example where we would need more details. Oh yeah, maybe just, yeah. Sorry, Simon. You can we can take the question from Christina, and then I can add. Yeah, I was going to say Christina just followed up with the, the ideas about um, working with with migrants in in, in Ukraine, and um, Christina, you're, you're you're saying your ideas are around how um, uh, working on legislation and how migrants have access to to to, to services like healthcare, etc. Um, this indeed sounds very much like a, a, a topic for um, for a fellowship. So yeah, we'd encourage you to, to develop that more. Yeah, just to add here uh, uh, with uh, on the last question from Christina and the study, if you are proposing any studies, uh, do, do keep in mind that we also want to see that you have a policy recommendation aspect to those studies. So again, we are not interested in academic studies for the sake of academic studies, but if you want to use that study to, uh, raise certain issues with the authorities or to raise awareness with the public about problems, that's, that's fine. 
yeah, it has to be the basis for something more than that. Uh, can I add here for whoever is thinks about the project and maybe this is the objective and the impact. It always helped me to when preparing our proposals and clear my proposals and, and project ideas, ask the question, so I do this and then what? So basically when you when your project needs to answer your idea needs to have this because this question so and then what is your impact and this is exactly what we want to see in your fellowship so you are able to not just you know do a study for the sake of study as monica mentioned but to show us and then what if you deliver capacity building if you deliver any workshops or webinars for the users for your community and so on, tell us we deliver this and then what? So what's going to happen next? You know, that that is if you develop a solution, a solution, a digital solution, if you open any data, tell us so what? So that's like a general recommendation. Uh, okay, sorry, found one more question, and I think we're gonna close with this one in yeah. the chat. Monica, I have a question whether establishing a women and youth council on the local municipality is a legible idea. I honestly do not know how to answer that because I'm not sure exactly what it means that you would be establishing a youth youth council. So if it's if it's a form of you know, NGO or or um, a, a so civil society organization, an association, or with then that might be eligible. Uh, obviously, it can't. The fellowship can't be simply about establishing this. Um, we would need to understand more. This. If yeah, or just, exactly. Not just about uh, not just about registering this. Um, if it's we we cannot fund local authorities, so that's clear if it's something that would somehow legally fall in the category of local authority or uh, body related to local authorities then then that might be a problem for us if it's a civil society organization and you can explain what that civil society organization would be doing within the time frame of your fellowship project then yes potentially yes but uh, simon you know please feel free to add because i think this one is a bit clear. Uh, I might also continue with my previous basically I when you when you suggest such things so you establish with council and so what so basically your your fellowship is not about the establishing this it's about this the impact so to try to explain us in the concept note I would recommend you try to when you prepare your concept note you can always apply, you can always submit it and see from there. But when you prepare this, please do try to answer this question. You will establish this council and so what? <laughs> uh, one more question in the Q&A from Luzine, and I think that's going to be the, really the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is about whether uh, uh, you can buy equipment and um, transfer it to the beneficiaries of the project in order for them to participate in the project and use the, the, those skills in the future. Um, you will see in the guidelines that we have a list of ineligible costs. Oh, okay. Uh, Narek wants to talk. So, um, okay, let's let's give her the floor and then we can answer the question. Thank you very much for answering my question. My question is following. In our region, there are some women and youth that want to participate in local governance. So the head of municipality is not against establishing a youth and council. So I want to facilitate the establishment of this council under the local municipality so they can raise some important issues for them and have a platform to raise their voice so my initiative is is this some sort of like this can i can i ask a question here monica do you mind Simon? yes so uh okay the first question when you mean establish a council do you mean to register it as a legal entity uh, uh, not a legal entity. The Armenian legislation give possibility local municipalities to have some sort of councils. 
So this council will function under the municipality. It will be voluntary organization that will uh, that yeah. will uh, facilitate the work of the municipality. It okay. is not in some sort of NGO like that. It's, it, it will be supervisory body that will uh, facilitate uh, the issues that are important for them. Okay, that's question number one. Question number two, are you, are you a civil servant yourself? Uh, I am not a civil servant. I am an NGO representative, okay, so wonderful. I want to facilitate the process. Okay, so what do you mean with facilitation the process? What will you do specifically within the fellowship then? What uh, do you fellowship, want to do? I want to establish clear link between the municipality and the- In what way? Uh, yes, and the local youth and women. So the, the, I want to facilitate the process. I want to give them training, guidelines, everything necessary to boost their capacities. So they will be able to uh, have a direct link and municipality. We, uh, after the fall, at the end of the fellowship, the municipality will establish this council and it will be permanent body. So it will have a continuation uh, and I will specify it in the concept note. Okay, so basically now can I help you a bit with a rephrase in this from what you explained, the objective, uh, the objective, I would say is to build the capacities of local organizations of local civil society youth and women organizations in your region to be able to participate in the decision making within the relevant policy body uh, of the local municipality. That's exactly. basically what you're going to do. And the outcome of this will be them joining the, uh, the council established by the municipality. Yes, that, exactly. that's, that's the outcome. Okay, yes, then it's then I think it's there is nothing that uh, goes against the eligibility criteria. And yes, we are looking forward to receiving your concept note in this case. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because, because it will be permanent body and to end fellowship we end, this body will be established. You can't advocate for your fellow for your concept <laughs> note right now. You need to <laughs> submit it. I'm sorry, Narek. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, yeah, so to go uh, back to the question, I think now there's another question in the meantime from Lucine on the issue of the equipment. So if you uh, if you go back to the guidelines, you will see that we have a list of ineligible costs, ineligible costs, yeah. <laughs> and one of these uh, costs is the cost of purchasing equipment. Uh, there is a uh, there is a footnote there on a bracket saying that the rental of equipment may be allowed if it's justified by your action. Um, I, some of you may be familiar with how EU funded grants work and that's why Lucine, you were probably asking about transferring any kind of equipment that you might be purchasing to the beneficiaries. That's not possible for us. It's not possible within the framework of our project. Um, but you can indeed rent out equipment if it's needed for your action, not buy it. Um, we have another question, a last question on whether it's possible to create and conduct a training course or education activities in general for the beneficiaries of the Eastern Partnership countries. Um, yes, I mean, we had, plenty of fellowships that included a training components or educational activities component in there. It has uh, to be again linked to, it, you, you have to be able to show what your impact will be um, and what you want to achieve with that particular training course. But as a type of activity, it's eligible, yes. I don't know if Simon or Lira want to add something. I wrote officially that we are we are closing <laughs> the discussion session. I mean, we need to share our contact details and the very final slide that Lena asked us to, to do. Yeah, exactly. I just, yeah, we, we, I, I will close with a very strong recommendation that people go to the guidelines. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of information there. And if you find something which you're not sure about, then please 
send us an email question and we can follow up with any issues that you have that are on in, in, uh, in the guidelines so that we can answer. And we know that particularly for Armenia and Azerbaijan and uh, Georgia, we have Mariam also ready to, to, to help with, with, with questions from those countries. And Elena, for questions from Belarus, Moldova and, uh, and Ukraine with their contact details on the screen. So uh, thank you all very much from, from, from me. Monica, I think maybe the final word is yours. Yeah, um, not not much left to say other than please apply as soon as possible. We really can't wait to see what ideas you have um, and and to be in touch with with you. Um, yeah, I think uh, this was already mentioned. If you know other friends, colleagues who might be suitable and interested in the project, please share this with them as well. Um, we, we will be posting the recording. And um, yeah, other than that, good luck and uh, hope to hear from you soon with your ideas. And thanks for staying uh, with, with us throughout the